Human rights groups typically use testimonies to establish facts about reported human rights violations. But how do we know whose testimony is relevant, and even more importantly, whose testimony is true? As a child, you likely played the game called Chinese Whispers or Telephone. If you haven't, it goes like this. The first person in a line or a circle whispers a message to the next person, which is passed down through the line until the last player loudly announces a message to the entire group. Errors typically accumulate with each retelling so that the statement announced by the last player differs, often amusingly so, from the original message uttered by the first. There are a number of reasons this message changes as it's passed down the line. Anxiousness or impatience and erroneous corrections play their part. But sometimes players may deliberately alter what is being said to guarantee a changed message by the end of the line. And this is the pitfall of testimony-based research. With time and repetition, the testimony here might not be what actually happened. So your goal is to find the person closest to the event as possible. Typically in a court of law, the only testimony that would be accepted is a primary testimony, and this can only be given by a direct witness. A direct witness or first-hand witness might be the victim of a human rights violation, or it could be someone that was present when the violation took place. Those people are always the best interviewees. But sometimes you won't be able to speak directly to a victim or a direct witness. Sometimes the victim is in prison or unavailable for another reason. In these cases, a human rights researcher often relies on a representative of some sort. Representatives might include a family member, a lawyer, or a close associate. Sometimes it's difficult to identify a good source. So at the end of this lesson, you'll do a short quiz that will help you think about who might be the best source of information. Once you identify a suitable interviewee, you need to make sure that you're communicating in a safe way. Remember, you must operate under a do no harm principle. If using digital means of communication, always make sure you have a good understanding of general digital security, such as email encryption, before getting in touch with interviewees if they are at risk of getting their communications intercepted. It's also important that you keep in mind how you will safeguard your own notes or digital recordings. Are you within the reach of authorities that might try to obtain or abuse your interview documents in a way that might have consequences for your interview subject? If so, you need to take appropriate precautions. You also need to make sure that you are aware of any potential negative repercussions of your work. And while your mission is to promote human rights by documenting and exposing abuses, your priority must be to avoid more harm to your interviewees or others. Before you do an interview, you must obtain informed consent. This means that the interviewee must fully understand any risks and understand what you plan to do with the information that you're collecting and any implications, risks, or other consequences associated with the interview. This is a process for you to assess the interviewee's privacy and security into consideration. In fact, it's so important, the entire next lesson is dedicated to it.